In the previous videos in this series, we have learned how to break a vector into components. And we've also learned how to derive the magnitude and direction of the overall vector from its components. Now, in this video, we will demonstrate an application of those two skills, which will illustrate why those skills are a valuable tool for solving physics problems and why vector components are a crucial tool for solving physics problems. We're going to work through an example of how to add vectors and um, that will demonstrate how vector components are a crucial tool for adding vectors. So the purpose of this video is to give you some insight into why vector components are a crucial tool for solving physics problems. And uh, of course, this is also going to give us some extra practice with the skills of breaking vectors into components and figuring out the magnitude and direction of the overall vector from its components. Uh, and finally, of course, um, this video is also going to demonstrate how to solve problems about adding vectors. Um, and that's a type of problem that's often covered in the first few weeks of your physics course. So um, it may be helpful to you to know how to solve that type of problem early in your physics class. All right, so to start with, I'd like to talk about these two vectors. I want to talk about these two vectors, A and B, which I think we briefly introduced in the first video in this series. Notice that these two vectors have different magnitudes, but they have the same direction. Okay, now something that we might have to figure out in physics is suppose that we are given a new vector C, and suppose that C is defined as A plus B. By the way, notice here that I'm not really telling you what A and B and C stand for. I'm not telling you what concept they stand for, because right now I just want to think about vectors in general. So these are just some general vectors, and we're not going to associate them with any particular physics concept for right now. And here's a new general vector C that is the sum, the addition of A and B. Now, how do you add vectors? You might have seen this in your, in your class or in your textbook. Here's how you add vectors. So we can add vectors by first drawing the vector for b. Actually, it said a plus b, so I guess I'll do a first. So now to add vector b, I'm just going to copy vector b here. And we just place it where vector a ends, like so. This is called, you might have heard this called the head to tail method because we put the tail of vector b at the head of vector a. So this is a plus b. To um, find a plus b, first you trace out a, and then at the end of a you trace out b. So what would be vector c? Vector c would be this entire length. We'll just copy that and we'll relabel it as one vector. We'll call this. vector c. And what's going to be the magnitude of vector c? Well, I think you can see the magnitude of vector c will be 5 plus 8, or 13 units. And what will be the direction of vector c? Well, the direction of vector c will be this angle of 15 degrees. Okay, so 13 units represents the magnitude of c, and 15 degrees represents the direction. So, to add these two vectors, we just added their magnitudes. To add these two vectors, we just added their magnitudes, and we kept the same direction as before. But, does this method that we just used for adding vectors, does this always work? What do you think? Please pause the video and try this problem. Uh, first, let me make a note of what the question is asking us. It's always good to start by making sure you know what the question is asking us. So the question is asking us for the magnitude of E. A good symbol for that would be this. 
and the question is asking us for the direction of E. So it's always good to start the problem by writing down symbols for what the question is asking. So this is what this question is asking us for. All right, so it makes sense to start by drawing E, and E equals A plus D. So how would we do that addition? Uh, so I guess first we would take vector A, place that here, and then we want to take vector D, and where am I going to put vector D? So remember we want to put the tail of this vector at the head of the other vector. We want D to start where A left off. So we'll put that like so. And that will represent A plus D. So this was our vector A. five units. And this was our vector D of uh, eight units. Okay, and again we're using the head-to-tail method where the head of the first vector goes at the tail of the next. Now can you draw vector E? Can you draw the sum? You might want to pause the video and see if you can draw vector E. Um, well, vector E begins over here and leaves off over here. like so, and it'll point in this direction, so we'll call this vector E. Do you see how this represents E, the sum of A plus D? If you start here and you trace A and then you trace D, you get to here. And if you start here and you trace E, you will get to the same place. So that's a demonstration that the vector E is the same as the vector A plus D. This is the head-to-tail method of adding vectors. By the way, do you see that we have not used components yet? This has nothing to do with components. This is just the head-to-tail method for drawing the, the addition of two vectors. Now, can we just, how, how long is vector E? What's the magnitude of vector E? Is it going to be 5 plus 8? Is it going to be 13? I hope you can see that there's no reason to expect this length to be 5 plus 8. There's no reason to expect this to be 13. Since these two vectors were pointing in different directions, there's no reason for this length to just be a simple sum of 5 plus 8. So this is not going to be expected to be 13. We can't just add the magnitudes. So the lesson of this example is that you usually can't just add the magnitudes to find the direction of a vector, uh, to find the magnitude of the sum. And of course, um, then we also have another problem. What's the direction of this vector? This vector had a direction of 15 degrees and 65. Um, it might be uh, very mysterious how we could find, say, how big this angle is. How can we find this angle? That might be uh, quite difficult. It's really not quite clear how to find the magnitude and direction of this vector. So notice it's only easy to add vectors when they're parallel. When vectors are parallel, then you can just add the magnitudes to find the overall magnitude. And when vectors are parallel, the direction of the sum is the same as the direction of the individual vectors. But when vectors are not parallel, you cannot add the magnitudes to find the overall magnitude. Um, and it's not clear at all so far what the direction of that new vector should be. So we have a very important lesson here. To add vectors, you cannot just add the magnitudes. E is not just 13 here. You can't just add the magnitudes, except for the unusual case where the vectors point in the same direction. In a normal case where vectors point in different directions, 
you can't just add the magnitudes. That's important to emphasize because that's a common mistake that students make. Um, students make that mistake probably because they're not actually visualizing or drawing the vectors. They're just trying to um, add them in their head. If you actually visualize or draw these two vectors, I think it's pretty obvious that the sum is not just going to be 13. Okay, so then we have the question, how do we add these vectors? If this is the, not the right way to add the vectors, how do we add the vectors? How do we figure out the length of this line? And how do we figure out the angle for this line? Well, the answer is that physicists have come up with a clever trick for adding vectors, even when they're not pointing in the same direction. And the clever trick is to break the vectors into components. And obviously that's the main topic we're focusing on in this video series. By breaking these vectors into components, it will become quite simple to add them. If we break the vectors into components, the components are easy to add. We can't just add these overall magnitudes, and we certainly can't just add these angles, but you can add components. Let's start sketching out, then, how we're going to attack this problem. We know that we, can't, we cannot just take the magnitude of A and D and add them to find the magnitude of E. So we've discussed that the trick that we're going to use is we're going to break these vectors into components. So what will we know after we've done that? How will we symbolize what we know? Well, when we've done that, we'll know AX and AY. And we'll know DX and DY. So our first step is going to be to find these two sets of components. So let's get to work on that. So the next thing we have to do is break the vectors into components. That's a skill that we've already learned uh, how to handle. So we know the skill of when you're given the magnitude and direction of overall vector, we know how to find the components, and that's what we're going to have to do here. By the way, if you got stuck on this problem and you didn't get this far, maybe now would be a good time to pause the video and try to break these vectors into components. If you didn't already do so, now you should try to break the vectors into components. The problem doesn't say to break the vectors into components, but that's the only method that we, that's the method that we need to use to add the vectors. Okay, um, so to break these into components, I can break this vector into components. Um, I can say that... Uh, Oh, so one thing we're going to have to do here is choose our axes. On all the previous problems, in all the previous problems in this video series, I've been giving you the axes. But in most problems, you have to choose the axes for yourself, and that's the case here. Now, you can choose any axes you want. If you wanted to, you can choose kind of weird diagonal axes like this. But the easiest approach here is just to choose a horizontal and a vertical axis. So that's what I'll do. I'll choose a horizontal and a vertical axis. And the conventional horizontal and vertical axes are to the right and up. And there isn't any reason on this problem why we shouldn't use those conventional axes. So I'll use these conventional axes. Why are horizontal and vertical axes more convenient for this problem than diagonal axes? Well, the reason is because the angles that we were given are defined relative to the horizontal and the vertical. This angle is defined relative to the horizontal, and this angle is defined relative to the vertical. As a result, it turns out to be convenient to have a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. And this type of diagonal axes would not be convenient. Not, would, would not be convenient for this particular problem. And then how do we break these into components? Well, remember, through the tail of A, I need to draw a reference line that's parallel to X. That was actually already kind of drawn for us right here, so I just need to extend it. And then through the head of vector A, we need a reference line parallel to Y, which is already drawn for us. I just need to extend it, and now we have the right triangle. So here's our components. Here's our X component. And here's our Y component. Make sure you label those components, AY and AX. Um, and we know the overall vector points up and right, so the components point up and right. Or you could say that this should be the head of the component because it's at the head of the overall vector, and this should be the tail of the component because it's at the tail of the overall vector. Okay, um, and while we're at it, why don't we break D into components? 
So again, um, here we need to uh, draw a we need to draw lines that are parallel to the axes. Um, maybe I'll stick here with the this. I already have a line here that's parallel to the y-axis. So through here, I'll draw a line that's parallel to the x-axis. And maybe I'll relabel this so things don't get in other things way. So here I'll draw a line parallel to the x-axis. We already have a line parallel to the y-axis. So this could be dx and this could be dy. d points up and to the left so the components point up and to the left. Or you can say this is the tail of the overall vector, so it should be at the tail of the component. And this is the head of the overall vector, so it should be at the head of the component. Now, of course, this isn't the only way to draw the components. If you wanted to, you could have drawn dx like this. You could have drawn dx like this and dy like this. You could also have drawn the components like that. That would be perfectly okay. I just drew it over here so it didn't kind of overlap so much with the rest of the picture. What now? Well, I would recommend that the first thing you should do is figure out the signs on your components. If you leave the signs for last, you might forget them altogether. So let's do the signs on the components. What's the sign on this component? Well, right is our positive direction. And this component? Well, up is our positive direction. And this component? Well, up is our positive direction. And this component? Well, left is our negative direction. So we have a negative component here. This is one of the most important parts of the solution right here. Did you make sure to get dx negative? If you didn't get dx negative, you completely messed up. The sign is just as or more important than the magnitude, so make sure you got that negative sign. If you do the component, if you do the signs first, you're less likely to forget them. Okay, and now we can use Sokotoa. So I'm going to focus on this angle and this angle. So this side is adjacent to the 15 degrees and this side is opposite to the 15 degrees and this side is adjacent to the 65 degrees and this side is opposite to the 65 degrees. This side is the hypotenuse of the D triangle and this side is the hypotenuse of the A triangle. So we have that the cosine of 15 degrees is adjacent over hypotenuse and the sine of the 15 degrees is opposite over hypotenuse and the cosine of the 65 degrees is adjacent over hypotenuse and the sine of the 65 degrees is opposite over hypotenuse. So for the 15 degrees, the adjacent side here would be AX and the hypotenuse would be RA, which is 5 units. And the opposite side here is AY, and the hypotenuse is 5 units. The adjacent side for the 65 is the magnitude of DY, and here the hypotenuse is 8 units. the 65, the opposite side is dx, the magnitude of dx. We know dx is negative, but we're going to figure out the magnitude of dx, and the hypotenuse is 8. So we multiply both sides by 5 here, 
multiply both sides by 5 there. We multiply both sides by 8 here. Oops, I forgot to put this 8 in. And here again in this equation, we solved for the magnitude of dx by multiplying both sides by 8. All right, uh, now we're ready to use a calculator. So we have 5 cosine 15 degrees. Make sure you're in degrees mode. 5 sine 15 degrees for magnitude of ay. 8 cosine 65 degrees for magnitude of dy and 8 sine 65 for magnitude of dx. magnitude of AX then is 4.8 units. Magnitude of AY is 1.3 units. Magnitude of DY is 3.4 units. So we have here that the magnitude of dx is about 7.3 units. Now we figured out the magnitudes What are the signed values of the components? Well, AX we decided would be plus. So that's plus 4.8 units. And AY we decided would be plus. So that's plus 1.3 units. And DY we decided would be plus. So that's plus. 3.4 units, but dx we predicted would be negative. So this is negative 7.3 units. As usual, sine and cosine don't tell us whether the components are positive or negative. That's something we have to figure out separately. Now we can build all this information into our picture. So this is our plus 4.8 units, and this is our plus 1.3 units, and this is our plus 3.4 units, and our negative 7.3 units. Well, we haven't finished the problem yet, but we've gotten some important intermediate results. So now is a good time to pause and ask, do these intermediate results make sense? Do these components make sense? Do you remember how to check that? Um, now would be a good time to pause. Pause the video and, and use the techniques we've talked about for checking those results. Well, here's the ideas that we've been using to check numerical results in these videos. So, for example, if we look at the lower triangle, um, we can see that this hypotenuse five units really is longer than either of the two sides. So that checks out. And if we look at the top triangle, um, we can see that this hypotenuse, eight units, really is longer than either of its two legs. So those two aspects check out. Also, we should check that longer sides are opposite bigger angles. So it should be clear in the bottom triangle that this is the smaller angle, 
and that this acute angle at the top is the bigger angle. That should be obvious because this angle is less than uh, 45, so this has to be greater than 45 so that they can add up to 90. And we can see that the bigger angle here is opposite the longer leg of 4.8, and the smaller angle is opposite the shorter leg of 1.3. So that checks out. We can also check that here, so it should be clear that this is the bigger of the acute angles because it's bigger than 45 degrees, and without doing calculations, we can see that this is the smaller of the acute angles. It has to be less than 45 degrees so that the two acute angles can add up to 90, and we have that our bigger angle is opposite the longer leg, 7.3, and the smaller angle is opposite the shorter leg, 3.4. So again, that is consistent with the way it should be, and it looks like we, we did the problem correctly so far. Oops, I guess I should, I should have written this as the smaller angle. This is the smaller of the two acute angles, and this is the bigger of the two acute angles. The smaller angle is opposite the shorter leg, the greater angle is opposite the longer leg. Did you remember to use these ideas to try to check the results? Um, I encourage you to try to get into the habit of checking if your results make sense, and these are some good ways to do that when you're working with components. By the way, one other way we can check that this makes sense that applies here, in this case, I tried to draw the vectors roughly to scale. I tried to draw this angle so it really is close to 15 degrees, and so that this really is close to 65 degrees, and I tried to draw these two lengths of so 5 and 8, so they're roughly to scale. Um, and as a result, the components should also be roughly to scale. That gives us another way to check our results. Um, notice that in the picture, this horizontal leg is longer than the uh, vertical leg. It's just drawn that way in the picture, and that was consistent with our numerical results. And you can see that in this triangle, the horizontal leg was drawn longer than the vertical leg, and that was, again, consistent with our results. Um, since I made an effort, in this case, to draw the angles and the lengths roughly to scale originally, um, we can use that as another way to check whether um, the lengths that we calculate are consistent uh, with our diagram and whether they make sense. And so far, um, they, uh, they are consistent and they do make sense. Again, about that technique of comparing um, the lengths on the page to the numerical values only, makes, uh, only works if you make uh, an effort to draw um, the, your diagrams roughly to scale. Okay. So we've successfully broken the vectors into components. We broke the vectors into components. We went from here to the components. Now the purpose of that is that makes it easy to add the vectors. We've said that you can't add the vectors by just adding their magnitudes, but you can add the vectors by just adding their components. We can just add the components. That's all we need to do now. Let's try to build that next step of the solution into this overall framework. So what we've done so far is we've broken these two overall vectors into components. And what's going to be our next step? Um, well, what are we going to do with these components? Well, as I was just saying, we can add these components. We can add these components. What are we going to get when we add these two components? Try to use the exact right symbol. The exact right symbol for what we get when we add these two components is the x component of vector e. If we add the two x components, we get um, the x component of vector e. And we can also add these two y components, and that will give us what? That will give us the y component of vector e. Um, once again, it would be wrong to add these two overall magnitudes. You can't just add the 5 and the 8 to get 13. That doesn't make sense, but it makes excellent sense to add components. Um, and a little later in the video, a little later in the video, I'll try to demonstrate to you that it, um, while it doesn't make any sense to add these two numbers, it makes excellent sense to add uh, the components. So I hope that will be apparent as we continue through the video. So now we're basically going to go from here to here in our sketch. This will be step two. In step two, we add the components.
it's not legal to add the overall magnitudes, but it is legal to add the components, and we'll see why. Okay, so I just wanted to illustrate how this next step is going to fit into our overall solution of the problem. And now we have to proceed forward and actually do that addition of the components. So we can just say that if E equals A plus D, that means that EX equals AX plus DX, and EY equals AY plus DY. How about this? Is this true? No, this might look very similar, but this is completely false, right? You can't just add the magnitudes of the overall vectors. You can't just add the 5 and the 8. The magnitude of E is not just the sum of the other magnitudes, so this equation is wrong, even though it looks so similar to the other equations. So, this is wrong, but this is true. The E vector does equal the A vector plus the D vector but you don't figure out the magnitude of the E vector by adding the magnitudes. So this is true, but not very useful for actually solving the problem. And this is false. This is a mistake. But these two ideas are true. We can figure out the components of E by just adding the components of the individual vectors. That's why we broke things into components. So EX, AX here would be plus... 4.8 units plus dx, which is negative 7.3 units. And ey would be ay, which is plus 1.3 units plus dy, which is 3.4 units. So we've got 4.8 plus negative 7.3. 4.8 plus negative 7.3. So EX is negative 2.5 units. And our EY is going to be 1.3 plus 3.4. You might be able to do these calculations without a calculator, uh, but I did them on the calculator, so that would give us 4.7 units. Now this is a component. Now this came out positive on the calculator, but as a beginner, we always put a plus sign in front of our positive components. So I'll add the plus to emphasize that that is positive. So notice that the key thing here was including the negative sign when we added the 7.3. So some people might say they're doing 4.8 minus 7.3, but I think to get started, it's better to think that this is about addition. We're not subtracting these vectors, we're adding them. Um, so there's not that we're not really doing a subtraction here, we're just adding a negative number. Rather than thinking that you're subtracting, I think you'll, your thought process will be clearer here if you say we're adding the vectors, so we're adding their components, and it just so happens that one of the components is negative. So we're not subtracting the components, we're adding the components, but that involves adding a negative number. We added a negative number because one of the components was negative. Okay, so are we done? Well, remember the question was asking us for the magnitude and direction of the overall vector, but we only have the components. 
we have the components of the overall vector, we don't have its magnitude and direction. So now we're going to have to use one of the other skills that we've learned in the previous videos. Now that we know the components of E, we have to go from here to here and find the magnitude and direction of the overall vector. I hope you think at this point that that's a boringly easy task to accomplish. But if you haven't done that yet, maybe you should pause the video and find the magnitude and direction of E. Let's take stock of where we are um, in our overall solution of the problem. So far we've accomplished step one. We broke the original vectors into components. Now we accomplished step two. We added the components to find EX and EY. And now we're ready for this step. Um, so this step will be step three. Um, and in this step we are going to determine we are going to determine the magnitude and direction of this overall vector of this overall vector from its components. That'll be the third and final step of the solution of this long problem. Well, first of all, we can uh, build this into our sketch. So EX here, we could start here and say that EX is along this line and EY is along this line. So we could say that this is our EX arrow. Negative 2.5 units. And uh, notice that in our picture, our picture really actually did predict that EX would be pointing in the negative direction. Our picture did predict that EX would be pointing in the negative direction. Remember that these are our axes, so the negative direction is to the left. Um, and for EY, we'll trace in this vector. So this is the E vector, and this is the EY vector. An EY vector of plus 4.7 units. So those are the components for our E vector, negative 2.5 and plus 4.7. The components pointed left and up. So the E vector um, is pointing left and up, as we would have predicted from our, um, from, uh, our original uh, visual addition of the uh, vectors. And the, uh, this is the tail of the overall vector, and it overlaps the tail of the X component. And this is the head of the overall vector, which overlaps the head of this component. So to find the direction, we might try to find this angle. This is the most convenient angle to try to figure out to find uh, the direction in this case. So we would use Sokotoa and we would say tangent of theta is the opposite side over the adjacent. So now we're focusing on this angle. Um, and this side would be adjacent to theta, and this side would be opposite to theta, and this side is the hypotenuse for the E triangle. So the opposite side is EY, and the adjacent side is EX, but we're focusing on magnitudes because we want lengths. So EY would be 4.7, and the magnitude of EX would be 2.5. And notice we don't say negative 2.5, because we're focusing on a length, so we want the magnitude. So we don't put in the negative sign there. So then theta would be the inverse tangent of 4.7 divided by... 2.5. Inverse tangent, 4.7 divided by 2.5. So about 62 degrees.
So we can build that into our picture. This angle turned out to be, what was that? About 62 degrees. Yeah, 62. Okay, so now I think we're ready. Oh, no, we still need the magnitude. We can use the Pythagorean theorem to find that magnitude. So we can say e squared equals magnitude of ex squared plus magnitude of ey squared. So e is ex squared plus ey squared take the root. And our components were 2.5 and 4.7. Don't forget to square those. Two point five and four point seven. So we're going to take the square root. I'm going to do this in one step, so I won't use a square root template, so I need a parenthesis to show that everything I'm entering is part of the square root. My calculator puts that parenthesis in automatically. Otherwise, you would have to put it in yourself. Okay. About 5.3. We would expect that this number, which represents the hypotenuse, has to be longer than either of these two numbers. And that, did, that is the way it came out. Five point three units. Okay, so we can say that that hypotenuse is five point three units. So notice that this number and this number is what all of our work was aiming to figure out. All of the work that we done that we did here was trying to figure out this number, the magnitude of e and this number, the direction of E. Now, did you remember to check whether these answers make sense? Try to get into that habit of checking whether your answers make sense. We know how to check that. If you, if you haven't checked it yet, maybe now would be a good time to pause and check it. We know how to check that. Whoops, it's these rules that we've already seen. So let's use those ideas. The longer side the longest side of the triangle should be the hypotenuse. Here's our hypotenuse of 5.3, and that did turn out to be uh, um, that's uh, turned out to be longer than either of the two legs. So that checks out, and um, we can see that this angle at the bottom is the bigger of the acute angles. Since it's bigger than 45 degrees, we know that the acute angle at the top has to be less than 45 degrees, so that the two acute angles will add up to 90 degrees. So this angle at the top could be labeled as the short, uh, smaller angle. And now we can see that the smaller of the two angles is opposite the shorter of the two legs, and the bigger of the two acute angles is opposite the greater leg. So that also checks out and is consistent with our geometric facts. So we've successfully checked that our answers do make sense. Um, again, I encourage you to keep um, trying to use these ideas to check um, your answers whenever you're working uh, numerically with um, uh, problems like we've been seeing here that deal with components and overall vectors. So now I think we have all the information that we need and we can write down our answer. So we can say that the direction of E is at an angle of 62 degrees as shown in the picture above. Remember, if you describe a direction with an angle, you need to have a picture somewhere so that the reader knows where the angle is. That's in the picture that we have up above. 
and the magnitude of E we decided was 5.3 units. Another way you could put that is you could just describe the overall vector E as having as being 5.3 units at an angle of 62 degrees. Okay. Took us a long time to work through that problem because, as usual, I was trying to meticulously show every single step. Um, but with practice, it shouldn't take you that long. With practice, it shouldn't take you that long to do these steps. The steps are not super complicated. I just wanted to take my time and show everything uh, clearly. Okay, um, so remember that we started with a pretty difficult problem. We were trying to figure out the length of E, the length of this, and that was really not obvious. Um, we can't just add the 5 and the 8. We couldn't just add, notice that 5.3 is certainly not 5 plus 8 or 5 or 8 minus 5. You can't just combine the magnitudes directly. Instead, we had to combine the components. And clearly, um, this direction is not 15 or 65. This is a, a completely different direction than the other two directions that we had. So I hope you can start to appreciate that this technique of breaking vectors into components it really is a very clever trick that physicists have come up with, a very clever trick for adding vectors that don't point in the same direction. And I hope you can see that it makes sense that we can add the components. So AX was 4.8 units to the right, and then DX was 7.3 units to the left. Well, I hope you can see that if you go 4.8 units to the right and then 7.3 units to the left, you really will end up 2.5 units to the left of where you started. It really does make sense to add those components as long as you include um, a negative sign when the component is in the negative direction. And similarly, if we start by, um, if we start here vertically and we go up 1.3 units and then we go up 3.4 units, I think it's pretty clear that in total we've been going up 4.7 units. That's very clear. The, the really clever part was the part where we went right 4.8 units and then we went left 7.3 units. And then we can see that overall that meant we went left 2.5 units. You really can just add the components uh, to find uh, the component of the sum of the vectors. Long problem. So now that we've, or at least it took us a long time to discuss it. So um, now that we finished the discussion, I, I want to go back to this, this picture. This picture summarizes that process that we used for solving the problem. So I hope that these steps are falling into place in your mind now so that you can see how each of the steps played its role in the, uh, in the long discussion of the problem that we've just had. So remember that what we're trying to do is add the vectors A and D. Um, but we saw there's no direct way to add the overall vectors A and D. We can't just add the 5 and the 8 to try to find the magnitude of E. So we can't go directly, so to speak, from here to here. So instead, you see, we had to use a trick. We had to use an indirect path to go from here to here. And again, the clever trick was to break these vectors into components. So the first thing we had to do was take these two vectors and break them into their components, AX, AY, DX, and DY. Then we were able to add their components. We couldn't just add the overall magnitudes, but as we've discussed, it did make good sense to add the components. Now, the only problem with that is that that didn't give us the overall vector E. That gave us the components of E. So then we still needed one third step, which was to determine the magnitude and direction of the overall vector E from its uh, components. So I'm just summarizing uh, the process that we just went through on this problem. So I thought that this was a good problem to try at this point in the video series because it gave us a chance to practice both of the key skills that we developed in this video series and also to show why those skills are useful on a practical problem. Remember, the two key skills that we've covered are how to figure out, we've learned how to go in this direction, and how to figure out vector components from an overall vector, how to break a vector into components. And the other key skill that we've worked on is we've learned how to take the components and figure out the magnitude and direction of the overall vector. 
And the purpose of this video was to give us some practice with both of those skills and also to show why those skills are so valuable in physics. So here we went through the process of breaking overall vectors into components. And here we went through the process of taking the components to figure out the magnitude and direction of the overall vector. And this framework also illustrates why vector components are useful. Vector components are useful because they allow us to do this step. Vector components are useful because it makes sense to add them. That's one of the reasons, anyway. One reason why vector components are useful is because it makes sense to add vector components. Once again, overall vectors are somewhat less useful. Overall vectors are somewhat less useful for solving problems because it does not make sense to add the magnitudes of the overall vectors. But as we've seen, vector components um, are very useful because it does make sense to add vector components. And we illustrated that on this problem in step two. So just to review, we started by breaking the overall vectors into components. And remember, this was the work where we did that. We used SOHCAHTOA and this work to break the two original vectors into components. You need to get to the point where that type of skill is boringly easy for you. Then in step two, we added the components. And here's the step where we did that. This is the step where we added the components to find EX and EY. And then finally, in step three, we had to use those components of E to find the magnitude and direction of the overall vector E. And that's what we did here. This was the work that we did to uh, use the components to find the magnitude and direction of the overall vector E. And again, you have to get to the point where this type of uh, calculation is boringly easy for you. Again, it took us a long time to talk through that whole process, so I think it's helpful to see the whole process sketched out like we have on the screen here right now so that you can see the logic of each of the steps. So again, the purpose of this video was to give us more practice with the two basic skills of breaking vectors into components and using the components to find magnitude and direction of the overall vector. And also, again, hopefully this gave you a feeling for why those skills can be helpful on physics problems. Pause the video and decide whether this is true or false. Uh, well, hopefully it's clear that this is false. And we can see that in the problem we just did. In this problem we were just doing, we were trying to add A and D. Now the magnitude of A is 5 and the magnitude of D is 8. 5 plus 8 is 13, but the sum of A and D does not have a magnitude of 13. Um, instead, uh, the magnitude, you can see the magnitude wasn't anywhere close to 13. So you can see that when vectors don't point in the same direction, as we already talked about, when vectors don't point in the same direction, it doesn't make any sense to add the vectors by adding their magnitudes. I already talked about that before, but I wanted to emphasize it just because that's a common student mistake. Why would any, you might think that's a kind of a silly mistake to make, if you look at this picture, and it is a silly mistake to make if you look at this picture, but the problem is that most students try to do problems without any picture. So most students, uh, when they see a problem like this, they don't form any picture at all. And if you don't form any picture at all, um, it's very tempting here to say that A plus D is 5 plus 8. Um, so remember that when you're thinking about uh, working with vectors, it's very important to draw pictures of the vectors. Um, otherwise, you can uh, end up uh, trying to do things that would uh, you could see were silly if you actually drew the picture. So again, looking here, it might be tempting to think that a plus d is 5 plus 8. But when we actually look at the picture, we can see that that doesn't make any sense. a plus d is this vector here, and there's no reason to think that this has a, a length of 5 plus 8. Now let's go back to that true-false question, pause the video and ask yourself, how could you rephrase this sentence so it's true? Well, one way to do that is to say, how, what is the right way to add vectors? So what do you think? What is the right way to add vectors? If this is the wrong way, what's the right way to add vectors? Well, that should have been pretty easy because we just did it. 
um, the right way to add vectors is by adding their components. And that's what we just did again on this problem. You wouldn't want to add 5 plus 8 here. What you want to do is break both A and D into components. And then from the picture, we saw that it made very good sense to add the components. It did make sense to add the components. It made sense to add the X component. Well, it made sense to add the Y components because they were parallel to each other. So clearly the total distance in the Y component was just 1.3 plus 3.4. That's the y component of the, the sum. And it also made sense to add the x components because they were anti-parallel to each other. And we took into account that they were anti-parallel by putting a negative sign on this component. And by adding those two components, it, we did get a reasonable answer for the x component of the sum. So this is the wrong way to add vectors. And this is the right way to add vectors. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to know how to break vectors into components. Um, now, can you think of another way to reword this so it's true? How else could you reword this sentence so it's true? Well, what I mean is, is there any time when it would be correct to add the magnitudes to add vectors? Is there any time when it is okay to add vectors by adding their magnitudes? Well, the only time you can add vectors by adding their magnitudes is when they're parallel. Um, if two vectors are parallel, you can add them by just adding uh, their magnitudes. And we actually discussed uh, an example of that at the beginning of this video. Here's that first example we saw. When we were adding a plus b, since a and b are in the same direction, it does make sense to just add uh, their magnitudes. If this is a and b is in the same direction, then the sum of those two vectors really would have a magnitude of 13. Uh, but that's the only time when you can add vectors by just adding uh, their magnitudes. And clearly that didn't apply to the problem here where the vectors were not parallel. Okay, so how do you add vectors? You don't do it by adding their magnitudes. That doesn't work unless the vectors happen to be parallel. The general way to add vectors is by adding their components. Let's try another quiz question. Pause the video and decide if this is true or false. Well, I hope it was easy for you to see this is false because we've talked about that before. If this is so obviously false, why would I anyone why would I even test this? Well, remember this is not this is false in the sense that it doesn't always work. However, it is true that we usually use cosine for x components. We usually use cosine for x and we usually use sine for y. So as I have in the previous videos, I want to warn you, don't be on autopilot. Even though you usually use cosine for x, don't assume you should always do that. For example, in this problem in this problem, we did use cosine to find ax, but we used sine to find dx, right? We used cosine to find this horizontal side, but we used sine to find this horizontal side. Cosine for ax, sine for dx. So that clearly shows you that you can't just assume that you always use cosine for x components. Uh, why did they come out differently? Well, here we were using an angle with the horizontal, but here we were using an angle with the vertical. Um, normally we use angles with the horizontal, and that's usually the case where you use cosine for the x component. But occasionally you'll use an angle with the vertical, and when you do that, then you're going to end up using sine for the x component. Well, the safest thing is just um, to figure out each problem from general principles, rather than trying to do it on autopilot. So how would you reword this so it's true? Well, here's the general principle that's always true. You always use cosine for the adjacent component, and you always use sine for the opposite component. Did you find this video to be helpful? If so, you can support the videos by making a monthly pledge of $1 or more at my Patreon page. You can visit my Patreon page by clicking the link on the screen or by using the link in the video description box. Thank you.